Thank you so much for coming. I am excited to be here. This is my first time at AWE. And so far, I've really liked the talks. Um, there, there's a lot more to XR than <laughs> just open XR. So um, I'm very excited to stick around and hear even more. So um, this talk is just an introduction to OpenXR, the working group within Kronos, um, what it is and why it matters. The, yeah, so let me just get started. Um, so who am I? I am Alfredo Muñiz. Um, uh, my day job, as everyone's been saying, I am a CTO and co-founder of a startup called Exceed. LLC, and we develop full body motion tracking sensors. Um, our goal is to make it affordable, make it so that normal people can use it, and just bring that technology um, into a lot of people's hands. Forward. Oh, thank you. Um, my side job, I guess, is being the chairman of OpenXR. So I was elected, um, I think it was last November. So I'm still fairly new, just a couple months under my belt. But uh, according to everyone, I seem to be doing pretty well. So um, I, I like the positive feedback, and it's been fun for me so far. So let me just talk about what we're going to do here in terms of AWE. So this presentation is just an introduction. It's high-level overview of what is OpenXR and what we cover. Um, the next presentation immediately after this is a tutorial in using OpenXR, specifically on a low level. So usually people use OpenXR through a game engine. Um, so this will explain why you would even want to use it at a low level by going through uh, an example. And then Denny um, will actually give a short demo on um, uh, the pass-through mode. Tomorrow, we also have a presentation at 10.30 a.m. Um, and this is Peter from Unity. They'll explain how to use OpenXR through Unity. So uh, stick around if you're interested in that. In terms of the long-term goal of the group, so I'm sure many of you remember, and maybe you still have devices like this, but, you know, we had, like, barrel connectors to charge, or even all these different types of USB cables, like the the weird one used for printers. I'm, I'm sure you all remember that. Um, so, you know, the world is moving towards USB-C. This is going to become the standard, and, you know, it's, there's a lot of positive benefits to it. Um, one of them is that the manufacturers of these products, they no longer need to accommodate all the different um, cable types. Now they just need to do USB-C. And it's very similar to OpenXR. So um, a few years ago, before OpenXR, we would have all these uh, different headsets, and they would require their own code. So you would use the Meta SDK or the Microsoft SDK, and your code would only work on that specific device. So we're trying to change that with OpenXR. Uh, such that you write the one application and it's going to work on all of them. And that, that is the OpenXR guarantee. So that, that's what we're working towards. <laughs> guarantee. <laughs> so <laughs> in terms of the scope, um, we cover quite a bit. And honestly, it's a bit ambitious, but... This is the future, and there's a lot of money going in, into this space. So um, I think we could do it with enough time. So obviously head-mounted displays, um, obviously controllers, where you can switch between different controllers, um, base stations, all sorts of trackers, haptic devices, game engines, um, 5, 5G cloud, and a, a couple more things. So... You might be wondering that what is in scope basically boils down to what do these headsets need to know? Any data that goes through the headset, um, we try to standardize. Uh, if there's something built on top of that, OpenXR doesn't really touch that. 
But anything that has to go through the headset and out, um, that's what we try to encompass. So uh, in legalese, <laughs> royalty-free, open standard, high performance um, to XR platforms and devices. Specifically, OpenXR is this big document that will sometimes really slow down your computer if you try to open it. <laughs> um, it uh, consists of just the manual that tells the headset manufacturers how to build their firmware so that when you try to access it through the API, it's going to work. Um, so that, that's what we call the specification. So w the working group is constantly trying to improve that, um, make it more clear, because we don't really tell people how they should implement something. We just give them like, uh, this is the input, this is the output sort of thing. So all of those implementation details, they the companies do on their own. So it, it doesn't matter to us how you do hand tracking, for example, as long as you provide those um, correct inputs. Um, and this allows companies to still maintain their IP, still maintain their confidentiality, because they do not need to share that with the group. Um, OpenXR is also extensions and API layers. So in a nutshell, extensions allow us to go beyond the specification and add in new functionality. So uh, for example, if there's a very specific um, new function that the Meta, MetaQuest implemented, it'll only work on the MetaQuest. They can do an extension for it. And then if more people support that, then it can be promoted and eventually other companies will support that feature. And then eventually it can be, become part of the specification. So that's kind of the process is we don't want to slow down people's progress because we need to be moving quickly as well, especially with uh, uh, big giants lurking around the corner. <laughs> um, but we do our best and that's how we keep it, keep it moving. API layers on the other hand, um, these are to modify existing functionality. So if you have, um, for example, if you have something giving you the controller pose, you can have an external system, such as a base station, and you can modify that pose using a different track system. Um, so that's the idea behind API layers. And all of this is enforced by the conformance test suite. So OpenXR doesn't mean anything unless we can actually you know, guarantee that it's going to work the same way. And so th that's what these tests are for. Um, all, all of, to become OpenXR conformant, you must pass all these tests. And it, what we look for is, is uh, when you render this cube, is it rendered in the right orientation? Or when you do hand tracking, um, does it actually give out the right outputs? So it, it is um, constantly being worked on. And it is the most costly thing for OpenXR, but it's also the most important thing, um, I think. <laughs> so OpenXR is cross-platform app development. As you can see from this diagram, um, before you would have to implement um, API for each and every one. So um, I already explained that. If you were, for example, WebXR, you would need a um, your, maintain your own libraries for Oculus, maintain your own libraries for the Vive, for the Magic Leap. But now um, you can combine all that and just do it in OpenXR. And that is a, a beautiful thing. So a little bit of history. Uh, let me just check the time. OK. A little bit of history. So the working group formed in 2017. Um, it took a while to actually come out with the initial specification. Um, that was released in 2019. And now we pretty much have worldwide adoption. Um, there are other standards out there, but my understanding is that um, OpenXR is the leading standard. Uh, so, so we're very happy about that. And um, a lot of uh, 
companies have also deprecated their own API. So like uh, Steam's OpenVR deprecated, um, Meta's uh, Oculus mobile SDK deprecated. It's all going towards OpenXR, and that's just because as a company, you don't want to maintain multiple APIs because one, it confuses developers, but two, you're going to need <laughs> people for each team, which uh, becomes costly. So um, in terms of adopters, um, here's a quick list. An interesting thing is that we also do uh, spatial displays, like 3D displays. So um, Acer, for example, I'm not sure if you've actually seen one, but essentially instead of having the 3D right in your face, you have it as a monitor. So when you're looking at a monitor, you can move your head around, and the way you look at it provides a, a depth, um, which is pretty cool. And it's also OpenXR. So the reason to become conformant is because any application that works on the headset will work on the spatial display. So you're immediately opening up your um, the amount of applications that you can run just by uh, going for the conformance. Um, our newest adopters, so the Magic Leap 2 is a recent one, as well as uh, ByteDance's uh, Pico 4. And Sony um, in Japan, they recently um, announced that they would plan conformance for the end of the year with their uh, spatial display. You may be wondering about their PSVR 2. Um, I don't have many details, <laughs> unfortunately, but uh, I hear that there is interest. In terms of engine adoption, so pretty much um, everyone tries to support OpenXR uh, to varying degrees, so either natively or as plugins. Um, we have Unreal, Unity, um, WebXR, and then the open source uh, Godot engine. In terms of applications, these are some of the ones you may have heard of. Um, Minecraft for sure. Um, Blender's pretty interesting because you can go in there with the VR and, you know, actually draw as, as you're in there, which is pretty fun. Um, and then we also have uh, professional applications. So the National Institute of Science and Technology, NIST, um, they created this uh, kitware where you can actually do data analysis. Um, so for example, you can take an object, you can shrink it with your hands, and then you can measure the mass or the size or the weight. Um, pretty interesting. And most recently, uh, Beat Saber actually hopped on board. So their alpha branch um, is now using OpenXR as the default, which is uh, pretty exciting for us. Um, in terms of my priorities as the chairman, um, I want to solve developer pain points. We get a lot of complaints, um, especially from developers that have a game in OpenVR. When they move to OpenXR, it's like, nothing works, everything's broken. <laughs> so we want to make that transition easier. Um, so, so I'm really trying to, I bring in developers to speak to us and we get their feedback and we try to fix those bugs. So another thing is optimizing efficiency. Um, a lot of OpenXR is done through volunteer work from these companies. Uh, you know, we have people from the API team of these companies and I guess it's their job to work on the API, which is part of OpenXR. But you have to think about it from a different perspective because um, OpenXR helps the industry, but companies have their own self-interest. So, you know, they want to push that first and then they would help OpenXR. So it's kind of this balance of, um, you know, where do you put in the time to do OpenXR? So uh, one of the things I did was I added new subgroups. So people that are very interested in developing these new technologies, um, they can come together 
uh, figure that out and then come back to the working group to, you know, just make progress quicker so that it's not all done at our face-to-face -face conferences. Um, another thing is documentation. We are severely lacking in this area. Um, and I think it's contributing a lot of to the first pain point where developers are just not understanding how to transition. Because of that, we funded a couple projects. So one of them is OpenXR tutorials, which we're very excited about. We have, um, uh, I forget their name, um, Sim, Sim something, Simulsoft. Um, they're developing our tutorials and they showed a very good demo and the progress is looking great. So I'm very excited for that. Um, expect that to be completed towards the end of summer. Um, let's see, there's also an open source runtime improvements. So if you've ever heard of Monado, um, they're the open source runtime. This lets uh, our developers develop faster because now they have an open source implementation of what it should look like. So it's easy to just look at that and uh, work on something together that's open source instead of work on something together that's up in the air proprietary that you can't see. And then there's an input binding UI. So Steam VR has this where you can assign your A button to the B button, for example. Um, we want to try to standardize this in a way that everyone wants to do just because it increases accessibility. Um, maybe someone only has a, is missing a finger or something. Um, we want to be able to accommodate that. And then just some users prefer playing in different ways. So in terms of our subgroups, um, the conformance test suite, where we fix these bugs, try to make it stronger. Um, input device plugin, where people can write their own drivers, um, opening up new, new, um, new avenues to connect um, devices, such as haptics or body trackers. Um, interaction system. Game engines have a very advanced interaction system that's not consistent with OpenXR. Um, and we have to work together to make it where it goes both ways and it's uh, easier for developers to understand. Um, 5G cloud to uh, do remote rendering and offloading. And then haptics. Right now our haptics is very simple. It's just buzz, buzz. <laughs> so we're really trying to um, make that more interesting and fun. So what you can do to help us out um, so we review public GitHub issues um, every week. Um, if you have any questions or anything, um, you're welcome to put them there and you will get a response. Um, and then of course there's the Discord channel, which is, um, it seems to be monitored by a couple of our people. So um, it's a good place to ask questions if you wanted something. Um, and that is it for my introduction. Uh, any questions? Are, are there ways to assign gestures? Like if you want to create your own gesture and have it be an input, is there a way to do that? Uh, yeah, so OpenXR has what we call an action system. So we abstract away buttons. Um, we, and this will be in my next presentation, but um, we do not care about the hardware. Okay. So we try our best to say, um, focus on context, focus on um, what you're actually doing. Yeah. So yes, in that case, a pinch would be an action that you can bind to okay. something. I, I have played with OpenXR in Unity, and so I understand the, the high level of it. And I, and I have played with the input devices, creating my own. So I, I see how you guys say primary button, secondary button, rather than like A or B, things like that. So I, I do notice the abstraction there, which is really great. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, thanks so much, everyone. So in about seven minutes, um, I'll start my next presentation.